Okay, go back to the first thing you did this morning as you got out of bed. Your feet hit the floor. Then what? Maybe you stretched, thought about your day, made your bed if you were feeling ambitious, but chances are you found yourself in front of a mirror pretty quickly. Am I right? Now think back over your lifetime of mornings. How many days did you not immediately see your reflection staring back at you? How many mornings did you not scrutinize each little detail? Well, today's episode introduces us to Jennifer Farr Davis, someone who can probably beat your record for no mirror mornings. In the forest, and when I started, this dates me a little, but it was before the age of the selfie, and so I really was not seeing my reflection. Jennifer is an expert in her field. Back in 2011, she set the record for fastest through hike of the Appalachian Trail for both men and women. It took 46 days, by the way. She's backpacked over 14,000 miles on six different continents, written eight books, speaks around the country, and has run Blue Ridge Hiking Company for the last 11 years in Asheville, North Carolina. On top of all of that, she's the mom of a two and six year old. Needless to say, she knows the trail and how to introduce all sorts of people to it. And after all this hiking, all this moving through the woods on only her two feet, she's come to know herself in a unique way. Those days and nights spent outside and away from mirrors, scales, and other methods for measuring ourselves have taught her that it's not about distance covered, but about making room for mindfulness, connectedness, and persevering joy. Like, I just hope that I'm that 80-year-old individual sitting on a stump looking out at the mountains, and that counts. It might be like five feet from the trailhead, but that's hiking. It counts, and it's there for you no matter where you are in life, no matter how fit you are, no matter where you live. Like New York City, I know it's crazy, but the Appalachian Trail is less than 30 miles away from it. Like You can always go take a hike outdoors. You're listening to Mental Note Podcast. I'm Ellie Pike. Well, I'm Appalachian, so that's what I tell people, and I think it's really interesting in the United States how a lot of us search for identity and search for our roots and do these DNA tests to know where we come from, and it's funny because I think what we want is a sense of place, and I feel very fortunate to have grown up in the Appalachian Mountains and then spent time exploring them as an adult, and so this is where I feel rooted. But it's interesting because growing up, I definitely didn't appreciate my surroundings and how beautiful it was. And I took it for granted and I didn't spend that much time outdoors. So that is what really shifted when I became a hiker. So when did that shift happen for you where you discovered the healing powers of nature and just your enjoyment of the outdoors? You know, I wish it had happened when I was a child and I did have the opportunity to go to summer camp and that was great, but I really feel like most of my life took place inside of walls. Like I think about growing up and I was in classrooms and gyms and my bedroom. And it just felt like my days were spent inside boxes, if that makes sense. And I think a part of me recognized that maybe without being able to voice it. But when I graduated from college, I thought my life was going to look and be very, very traditional. But there was something in my soul that was basically screaming at me to get outside. It was just like, you know nothing about the outdoors. I couldn't tell you the difference between an oak leaf and a, a, you know, maple tree. Like I know so little about nature. And so something very deep in my being was saying, go outside, spend time outdoors. And then growing up in this area, I had heard of the Appalachian Trail. So I thought, okay, that's it. Like that's my pathway into the outdoors. And the Appalachian Trail runs from Georgia all the way to Maine. Is that correct? Yeah, it's super long. It's about 2,200 miles. It travels through 14 states between Georgia and Maine. And when most people hike it, they're going to take usually about five or six months. I've been fortunate enough to complete the entire trail three times. And the first time was about a five-month journey. So just five months of walking in the woods and it was so hard and so humbling and completely life-changing and it has made everything different since then, honestly. Mm 
And was that your first real endeavor in nature was deciding to hike the whole trail? Oh, totally. Yeah. I took my brother's old Boy Scout gear. I made all these mistakes. I, yeah, did so many things wrong, but it was, it was an immersion experience. Like it's going from very, very little to completely living in the woods. This immersion experience equipped Jennifer with far more than just outdoor skills. It also began to transform the way she saw herself. What differences did you notice in yourself as you stepped away from technology, stepped away from the boxes that you lived in? What did you notice about yourself? You know, I think how capable you are comes out right away because we have all these crutches and we have all these resources and we're not... I think we're not allowing ourselves to be the problem solvers that we can be because when you're out in the woods and things go wrong, a lot of times there's no one around to help. So you have to figure it out on your own. And and at first it's scary and intimidating and, and you don't know what to do. But if you can just like take a deep breath and think through the options, it's amazing what you can solve on your own. And on the other side of it, it becomes very empowering. You know, so small things that went wrong for me within just the first week or two of my hike, obviously I had blisters and foot problems like a lot of hikers. I remember one night I I camped and then I heard there was a bear in the area and so I had to pack up in the dark and move. Um, I broke my stove the second week. Oh, I lost a fork so I picked up sticks and started using them as chopsticks. Like all these like small (laughs) little things that I was like, what do I do? Um, You know, getting lost on the trail. That happened pretty soon. And I always thought it was a mistake. And then I realized, you know, this is just part of the experience and it's really the response that matters. So, so tackling those, those problems and those conflicts and those things that arise with a sense of ability as opposed to just fear of what can go wrong really shifted quickly in me. And I imagine that took a lot of flexibility. And I know you've mentioned to me before that you're pretty perfectionistic and that you've learned a lot about yourself in that. So what was that like to go and not have it work perfectly? Yeah, well, I think, I don't know, perfectionist. I'm a very, I like to be a high achiever, right? Like I like to set goals and then accomplish them. And I learned very quickly that the trail doesn't care about my goals, like the weather doesn't care about my goals, or I, I lost this false sense of security and control. Like I let go of that because the trail forces you to. And I think, again, like in boxes or in rooms or in buildings where we can control the temperature and we can control the aesthetics and, and we think we can make all those choices to make our environment exactly what we want it to be. And then the reality is the natural environment is never going to be exactly what we want it to be, but it brings out what we need to be. And so then that was your first trip of three and your next two trips were drastically different, right? So can you tell us a little bit about those and some lessons that you learned about yourself? The trail had showed me that I underestimated my body and my mind. I think I had all these cultural and societal restraints on what I could do. And I do feel naturally gifted at at walking and being in the woods. And every time I just kind of turned my brain off and let my body do what it wanted to do, it just would not stop. And that's what it showed me time and again. And I loved it. Like I always, when I get out there, I'm always like, I wonder what's around the next turn. And I can't make that go away. Like I always just want to know what's around the next turn. And so my body is what told me that I could try for a record before my mind was ready to be there. Um, But eventually my mind started to believe that maybe I could try for a record on the trail. And then I heard all the external voices from people who said, you're crazy. You can't do that. Only guys have set the record. Only elite trail runners who win 100 mile races go and set this record. You're a woman. You're a hiker. You're not going to be able to do it. But one of the things I love about going outdoors is all those voices go away. 
and you just get to listen to the inner voice inside of you. And, and I constantly ask myself, cause it was a, it was a big deal for me and I trained for it and I dreamed about it. And I kept asking myself leading up to that, well, what is the worst case scenario? And the answer I came up with is that I'm going to spend time on a trail that I love doing what I love. So even if I wasn't going to set the record, what was so bad about that? This is something that really resonates with me about Jennifer's story. So often we allow all the ways we measure ourselves, be they mirrors, marketing, social media, or comparing our lives with friends to set the tone of our choices. We work out because we don't like the way we look. We binge the potato chips because we want to drown out the bad feelings. Or we lash out in anger because we're anxious. But Jennifer chose differently. She chose to do something she loved in a big way, and the crazy thing is, the worst that could come out of it would still be a great thing. And that root of doing what she loves rippled out and affected her other relationships in positive ways. My husband is always my favorite person, usually, but (laughs) even more so trying for the record because his job was to meet me at road crossings and then give me what I needed. And what I needed the most was food. Um, And the trail really revolutionized my relationship with eating because instead of seeing food as pleasure or indulgent, I just, I knew I needed it and it was fuel and it helped me achieve my objectives. I was like, if I want to hike another three or five or 10 or 20 miles today, I have to eat for it. And so I was constantly eating and, uh, and, and I would have never have been able to set the record without the proper amount of food. And it makes you feel so much better when, you, when your body needs it and wants it. And it's not what I learned, too. Oh, my gosh. So much of the time, it wasn't just physical. Like, obviously, I need the calories. But it's amazing how much the self-doubt creeps in when you're hungry. Like, when I was at a low point, I was like, I can't do this. The other people are right. And I am. I shouldn't be out here. And then I would have an energy bar. And all of a sudden, I was like, maybe I can do this. You know? So, so was, hanger was a different level. Yeah. <laughs> but I think you speak to something that a lot of us can understand. How much... Our hunger levels affect our psychological health. Yes. Yeah. For sure. And so I found that the boost from from food and that fuel was not just physical. It was also emotional and mental. Did you notice any differences in how you felt about your body? Um, And also not having access to mirrors Mm -hmm. or, you know, you're not showering every day and shaving your legs, right? It's certainly not the most feminine of experiences, quote unquote. So did you notice any differences for yourself and how you felt about your body? Yeah. And that actually took place mostly, um, on my, my first hike. That was the thing I think I valued the most about that first five month journey is, that I didn't realize how much magazines and commercials and billboards impacted me until I got away from them all. And, you know, in the forest, and when I started, this dates me a little, but it was before the age of the selfie. And so I really was not seeing my reflection. I, I knew I was dirty. I didn't, I didn't smell great, but I wasn't, I wasn't seeing myself. So I wasn't thinking about it. And what I was seeing, I was seeing other people that I passed on the trail. And I know that, you know, if I was kind or funny and if I could make someone else smile, that made me feel pretty. That was like a reflection, you know. And then the other thing I was seeing all the time was the beauty of nature. And the strength of nature and the and the power and it's interesting because that growing up in walls and being in boxes, I, you just feel so you, f- you feel so disconnected and you forget that you're a part of it. And then when you hike, you're like, wait a minute, like I am part of nature. Like I am part of this. I am part of this beauty and I'm connected to this forest and that mountain and this wildflower. And when you realize that, like when you stand on a mountain and you realize that you're a part of it, it makes you feel so beautiful. Now I realize few of us are able to drop our current paths in order to spend five months on a hiking trail. 
But I also know that nearly all of us would like to experience that same level of connectivity and joy that Jennifer just described. Can the two really coexist? Groundedness, connection, and assurance alongside careers, cars, and crowds? To find out, I reached out to Summerfield Johnston, a licensed therapist and wilderness guide who offers retreats linking adventure with intention. What Jennifer has done is often um, long distance travel in the wilderness. And at first that can feel like that's hard to access for folks. But the good news is the benefits are really available to all of us all the time. You know, my approach of working with folks is considering that our bodies are the part of the natural world that's always with us. And so working with our bodies, getting in tune with our nervous systems, learning to read the language of our bodies is a really great place to start. But I think first and foremost, really starting to listen to what in our bodies is telling us that we feel safe or unsafe, and that's language around the nervous system. So our sympathetic nervous system is what activates us, it's what helps us get things done in the world. It's also the same thing that we see in a rabbit when it's trying to run away from the predator. Um, It's very survival-oriented. But similarly, we, we also have a parasympathetic nervous system that helps us calm, it helps us rest and digest, it helps the rabbit not run all the time, but actually stop and chew grass. I think these days in our society, I think most people would really resonate with this idea of being overactivated and go, go, go all the time. Learning to take time to pause and feel what's happening in our body. Is there, is there a tightness? Is there um, activation? Or can we bring in like a calming and a settling? One way that I often will work with folks to do that is just focusing on the breath, focusing on bringing the breath into the low belly, um, taking time to pause whatever activity you're doing, whether it's working on your computer, having a tough phone conversation with a loved one, just pausing and feeling. So that sounds oversimplified, and yet if we start to do that consistently, we can find that we're really tuning into the nervous system more fully. Now, how that can be done outside and in connection with the natural world, we can do a million different things. An invitation that I have for my clients is to start taking a walk every day um, around their neighborhood, some local area that's really accessible to them, and to notice what plant or tree might draw their attention. And then begin to visit that plant regularly, you know, different times of day, different weather, different seasons. And as they see that plant, to tune in and notice what happens in their body as they're in sort of relationship with that plant. Just by dropping into our own bodies, we start to learn about the rhythms of the natural world around us. Another mindfulness activity that I love to facilitate and clients seem to really enjoy, it's called Dear Ears. And closing your eyes, Imagining that your ears are the size of a deer's ears. And you know, when, when it, like a twig snaps around a deer, its ears sort of pivot and turn and orient to the sound. So imagining that all the sounds that are around you are coming towards you, that you're not having to go out and get them. And so sometimes those sounds are birds outside your window. Sometimes they're the hum of the heat or air conditioning, right? They could be human-made sounds, and yet there is the perspective that actually everything around us is part of nature. And by tuning into the present moment, we're accessing that relationship. We're grounding ourselves into our bodies, our current moments, trying to not label or judge them, um, but really growing more familiar with the natural world, how it shows up in our everyday.
when we when we step away from the stressors of our daily life, but especially when we come into the calming environments of the natural world, we're going to see overall health benefits. I think in the moment, what I notice with my clients and with myself is more clarity, less anxious thoughts. Anxious thoughts can be considered our body's attempt to find the threat. Just like a deer might be looking for where its next predator is coming from, our anxious thoughts are our attempt to say, well, where is the next threat? How do I stay safe? When we step out of the, the pressures of our daily life and we come into a container, is what I might call it, that's truly accepting, um, where there aren't tigers that are hunting us, there are no deadlines, there are no um, social pressures, we can be ourselves, then literally our whole body can soften. Um, our breath can go really into our low bellies more deeply. We can experience less tension in our bodies. And as a result, when our body feels safe, our thoughts slow down. So those anxious thoughts will start to diminish, which is beautiful to see over many days. Like when I lead people out in the wilderness, I would say day three or four, we're just in a totally different place mentally. But if you make this a practice in your life, then you can access it with far less time in the wilderness. You can go to your local park, you can sit on your back porch. Your body can kind of learn to drop into that space pretty effectively. The trail has continued to be there for Jennifer even when she's not able to leave for months at a time. For her, its simplicity is its beauty. Merriam-Webster, the dictionary by by definition says that hiking is a walk in a natural setting. But if you can just get out and put one foot in front of the other, you can do this. And it's the mental and emotional benefits are just huge. And science is showing more and more that, you know, when they study people's brains and brain chemistry, it's like altered in such a positive way when they spend time outdoors. I'm not a record setter anymore. I haven't done anything that extreme in a long time. I've got my babies. I've got my business. I've got limited time. And the trail is still there. There's actually a common hiker saying that goes, the trail gives you what you need. And I just saw so many people needing so many different things and the trail provided like the trail provided that and so I was like man well the more disconnected our society becomes with the outdoors maybe if I can just connect people with the forest and with the wilderness and with the trails it'll be the best service that I could provide and so the fact that it meets you at every phase of life like I just hope that I'm that you know, 80-year-old individual sitting on a stump looking out at the mountains, and that counts. It might be like five feet from the trailhead, but that's hiking. It counts, and it's there for you no matter where you are in life, no matter how fit you are, no matter where you live. Like New York City, I know it's crazy, but the Appalachian Trail is less than 30 miles away from it. Like, you can always go take a hike outdoors. And that's exactly how she spends her days now. Jennifer started Blue Ridge Hiking Company in Asheville, North Carolina over 10 years ago. She helps people from all walks of life to connect with their natural world. And if all the benefits of this human nature bond sound intriguing, but when it comes to hiking, you say, no, thank you. Well, Jennifer says, don't worry about it. So I am not like a hiker and I love the woods and I think nature can benefit everyone. I like fully believe that, but it's not going to be everyone's big thing. And it's cool having kids because they're not you, right? They're their own little people. And what I see in my daughter is, you know, she can go outside with us and play and it's cool. And someday she doesn't want to do it and it doesn't like light her up. But when she does art, 
It is crazy because her little, you know, six-year-old active body and mind and need to like change activities very quickly and be talking, all of a sudden that kind of goes away. And she just like becomes so immersed in what she's creating. And so I totally believe that there's different vehicles for different individuals to find this gift of, of fullness and better self image and being present. And people are just, we're all so different nature and art and music and creativity and food and cooking, you know, all of those things. Like if you need roots and you need to feel like synced with something that is, that is bigger than yourself, like go to those things that have provided beauty since the beginning of time. And try the woods if you haven't already. Thanks for listening to Mental Note Podcast. I hope you take a step outside today and notice a little bit of nature that you'd normally just pass by. If you like this show, let us know. Rating us in your podcast app or on iTunes helps other people discover our work. To keep up with Jennifer and maybe even join her on the trail, you can find her on Instagram at Jen Farr Davis. That's Jen with one N, Farr, P-H-A-R-R, Davis. Or better yet, pick up her book, The Pursuit of Endurance. You won't regret it. As always, our show is sponsored by the dedicated people at Eating Recovery Center and Insight Behavioral Health Centers. They are trained, passionate, and able to help you find recovery. For a free consultation, please reach out at 877-411-9578. You can find out more about them and the people we interview on our website, mentalnotepodcast.com.